Good afternoon, everyone. This is Eric, and welcome to the Tuesday webinar in the Biomedics Academy series. Today, we're going to be looking at venous testing. So we'll be looking at uh, the nature of chronic venous insufficiency, or CVI, identifying patients, sending and receiving tests, and how the venous test um, sort of meshes with our uh, peripheral vascular assessment to enable you to do more testing for the PAD test. If you have any questions, please click the, and um, for our Zoom webinar attendees, please click the raise your hand button in the Zoom webinar control panel. For those of us following, uh, following on YouTube, uh, I encourage you to ask questions by sending us a, an email to support at biomedics.com or by calling us at 888-889-8997. Uh, our agenda for today, we're going to touch on uh, the nature of CVI, performing the test, sending and receiving the test, and identifying uh, patients for the test, candidates for the test. So your body has a bit of a sticky situation um, in terms of getting blood evacuated out of your feet. Uh, so if you think about it, it's kind, of, it's kind of difficult to pump blood three or four feet straight up, you know, without an extra heart down there in your toes to move that blood along. Uh, your body has a fairly clever way of managing this. Um, the veins in your legs are, generally speaking, deeply seated inside the muscles. So as your muscles contract, they squeeze those veins, just, and just like a tube of toothpaste, they sort of squeeze that blood up your leg, and that's how blood is evacuated out. Now, um, as the muscles relax, uh, you, uh, blood would generally go uh, fall down the leg with the force of gravity. In healthy patients, um, that's prevented by a series of one-way valves that, uh, again, prevent that backflow or prevent that reflux. In patients with CVI, uh, those valves have become damaged. That reflux isn't prevented, and um, blood tra uh, when the muscles are relaxed, blood travels down the leg with the force of gravity. So during sitting or standing, generally speaking, um, blood pools in the legs. Uh, and, and in patients who are susceptible to CVI, that, that pooling uh, in the legs can cause the veins to become distended or even cause damage to the valves. That's the origin or the cause of CVI. Now, because of the damage to those valves, obviously that venous pump that we were talking about on the last slide uh, fails to move blood um, up the legs because of those damaged valves. Because of that, blood is often forced to use smaller, more peripheral veins on the legs uh, to, make, to make their way up back toward the heart. Um, that uh, the, the use of this, the uh, more peripheral veins um, causes an increase in pressure there. It's really more blood than they were intended to handle, um, which, can, which is the source or the cause of varicose veins. Uh, you'll find as we go through the webinar that CVI and varicose veins are very, very tightly linked. Um, you know, you, you, you don't find varicose veins unless the patient already has CVI. Chronic venous insufficiency is a progressive disease uh, that's characterized by damaged valves, the way that we discussed. Uh, it can lead to more serious conditions if it's left untreated. Uh, one very common sy symptom, uh, just as an example, are venous stasis ulcers around the, the feet and the ankles. Um, for, uh, for those of you who attended the, or those of you who are familiar with the PAD test, uh, PAD causes uh, reduction in blood flow to the extremities, which means that there's not enough oxygenated blood that can cause uh, stasis ulcers of the kind that we're describing. Uh, with CVI patients, there's almost the opposite problem. There's blood in the legs, there's blood in the feet, but it's not being evacuated out. It's pooling or standing there, um, which means that the blood there isn't very highly oxygenated. The oxygen has probably already been extracted, which means that it's not very useful. It doesn't help heal those, um, heal those uh, ulcers, which means that um, Patients that develop venous stasis ulcers uh, often require prolonged therapy lasting more than a year to successfully treat or heal those. There are a lot of conceptions about CVI, which I would like to spend a little bit of time addressing here. Um, there are most of the misconceptions involve the severity of the condition. Um, you know, you'll find a lot of patients that believe that CVI that a varicose veins or CVI is simply a cosmetic problem. There's no, you know, there's no other physiological damage that's being done. Um, that varicose veins are an inevitable symptom of aging that uh, occur in everyone and there's not a treatment for it. It's just something that happens, part of old age. Um, 
similarly, you'll find that patients often want to wait a long time before getting treat treatment for CVI. Uh, there are misconceptions that you should wait as long as possible before receiving treatment so that you can uh, you know, put off the next installment of treatment or something along those lines uh, even further down the road. Um, there's a misconception that women should wait as long as possible, um, especially waiting until after they're uh, done having children before getting CVI uh, treated. You'll also find patients that believe that the treatment for CVI uh, requires painful surgery with ex extensive downtime or that treatment or, you know, coverage of this condition isn't handled by insurance in any way. I hope that we'll address at least some of those misconceptions during the webinar today. CVI is a very prevalent condition that affects approximately 30 million Americans. However, in large part because of the misconceptions we spoke about, only a fraction of those patients ever seek treatment for CVI, only about 1.9 million. Without treatment, those with the disease uh, can experience progressive symptoms that can be debilitating and affect their quality of life. In fact, more people lose uh, time off of work for venous disorders than for artery disease. Um, if you think about a patient, you know, if you think about someone missing work uh, because of a vascular problem, you know, it's, it's pretty common to jump to heart attack, something along those lines, something um, arterial, maybe a stroke. But in fact, uh, venous disorders, just because they're so much more common and so much less uh, understood, um, especially by patients, uh, venous time, you know, people lose more time with over venous disorders than from artery disease. Without treatment, CVI can lead to leg pain, fatigue and heaviness, pigmentation changes in the legs. Um, because of the blood is pooling uh, in the legs, you'll often find patients that have CVI that have sort of reddish or brownish discolorations because of that surplus of blood. Uh, sometimes they look almost purplish or, or bruise colored. That's something you're definitely wanting, uh, going to want to keep an eye out for. Um, Varicose veins in CVI, like I mentioned, are very, very tightly linked uh, because the blood is forced to use those peripheral veins to return to the heart. Uh, because of that pooling, um, you'll often find uh, swelling in the legs or alternatively cellulitis or phlebitis. Um, Uh, you'll, and then we've discussed uh, venous stasis ulcers already. Those develop when fluid drainage isn't adequate in the legs. Uh, a pulmonary embolism occurs when a blood clot called a deep vein thrombosis travels to your lungs and blocks blood vessels. This can cause low oxygen levels in your blood throughout the body and can cause damage to the lungs or other organs up to and including heart failure. Uh, because blood uh, in the legs with CVI patients has a tendency to pool, pooling blood has a stagnant blood has a tendency to clot. It's so uh, clots, embolisms, uh, deep vein thromboses are just like varicose veins, very tightly linked with CVI. You're often, um, you know, if you're looking for deep vein thromboses, you're going to be looking at patients who have a family history of CVI. If you're looking at CVI, you're also going to be looking at, a pa at patients with a family history of uh, thromboses. Uh, the probably most severe condition that can occur for CVI, those varicose veins, um, over time, as they handle more and more pressure, uh, as they become distended, they can eventually burst, which is called a varicose vein hemorrhage, another, various seri another very serious condition. Uh, risk factors for CVI include uh, family history of CVI or deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and this is an age-dependent illness, so you're, uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to have or develop. Uh, CVI, so increasing age over the page, uh, uh, over the age of 30. Um, vocations that involve long periods of sitting or standing. Uh, you know, blood is evacuated out of the legs by the contraction of the muscles. So when you're walking um, or running, there, you know, those muscles sort of contract in sequence, evacuating blood up to the uh, to the body very efficiently, but. Uh, it, it, when those muscles aren't being contracted, when, for example, you are standing for a long period of time, that's when the blood pools in the legs and the damage to the veins can be done. So um, vocations that involve long periods of sitting or standing, those patients are more likely to develop CVI in the long term. Women are more likely to develop CVI than men are, uh, particularly those who have undergone multiple pregnancies. 
Uh, you're also looking for prior, prior blood clots in the superficial or the deep veins. Just like with deep vein thromboses, uh, these blood clots are more likely to develop in patients with CVI just because the blood is pooling and stagnant there, which makes it more likely to clot. Uh, obesity or sedentary lifestyle, high blood pressure, and limited physical activity, again, are all uh, common risk factors for CVI patients. Uh, other things that are worth mentioning are a variety of conditions linked with varicose veins. So varicose veins uh, in the presence of an ulcer, varicose veins with inflammation or infection, varicose veins with pain, swelling, or edema, with phlebitis or thrombophlebitis, and embolism and thrombosis in the lower extremities. All things that you should keep an eye out for uh, in terms of developing, uh, in terms of examining patients for CVI. Uh, the patient should be wearing loose, non-restrictive clothing to allow for maximum blood flow. The legs in particular should be exposed so the cuffs can be placed directly against the patient's skin uh, on the calves. The patient should refrain from smoking, uh, alcohol, or uh, caffeine 30 minutes prior to the appointment. And the patient should, after they enter the exam room, spend three minutes resting without moving or speaking uh, in a sitting position. While they're in the sitting position, you're going to want to um, enter the patient's information. We'll do that in just a second here. Uh, and then you're going to want the patient to uh, assume the appropriate position for the test. Um, you're going to want to have them perched on the edge of the chair, really as far, their butt as far forward on the edge of the chair as they can get it. You're going to want the uh, right leg, you're going to want the, the body perpendicular to the ground. You're going to want the testing leg, which by default is the patient's right leg first, extended uh, at a greater than 90 degree angle, somewhere between 90 and 120, let's say. And then you're going to want the left leg uh, at about 90 degrees, and you're going to want both of those toes pointing forward. So you want the, the uh, feet in parallel with the toes pointing straight forward. Uh, the reason this position is preferred is that we really want to get the we really want to get as much pressure off the patient's veins as possible. Uh, a lot of the, the the veins that we're looking at really run up the back of the leg towards the butt, uh, and if you're placing a lot of pressure on that area, that's going to prevent. Um, that's going to prevent the evacuation of the blood flow up towards the heart. So um, you're going to want to take, relieve as much pressure off the back of the legs as possible by having them sort of perched on the edge of the chair, legs at about 90 degrees, toes pointed forward. Uh, at this point, you're going to want to coach the patient on how to perform a dorsiflexion. Um, it's not uncommon for patients to have difficulty or, you know, they find this particular exercise challenging. It's not a common uh, a common exercise, a common motion. Uh, the best uh, synonym that I've been able to find is the uh, is that it, you uh, you perform a dorsiflexion like you're operating a kick drum. You uh, again, and this is in the position we discussed on the last slide. The patient um, leaves their foot, their heel on the floor, raises their toes, and then forces their toes back down. That's going to um, that's sort of a, we're sort of hacking the body's own venous pump to evacuate blood out of the leg, out of the calf. Uh, and they're going to perform that forceful motion between five and 10 times. You don't want the mo motion to be too fast. You know, it's not up, down, up, down, up, down. You don't want it to be too slow either because otherwise, you know, blood is going to have a chance to uh, begin refilling before you finish the dorsiflexion. So it's a nice quick motion about, it should take about a second to perform each dorsiflexion, something like up, down, up, down, up, down. You're going to be able to watch the uh, blood evacuate on the screen. And then we're going to watch it refill. Now, I do want to take a moment and highlight that there is an alternative exercise to the dorsiflexion. Uh, it's not uncommon for patients to be unable to perform that motion. Uh, leg heaviness, swelling um, are very common with CVI patients, and they can sometimes prevent that motion from being performed. So uh, if the patient can't perform that motion, they can perform essentially the opposite exercise. Uh, in, the, in the position that we discussed on the last slide, you're going to have the toe uh, you're going to leave the ball of the foot resting on the floor. The patient's going to raise their heel, and they're going to force the heel down. Uh, the uh, heel lifts, uh, the alternative exercise, don't evacuate blood quite as well as the dorsiflexions, which is why we prefer the dorsiflexions, but they do work as an alternative uh, if the patient's not able to perform that dorsiflexion motion.
Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention on the subject, um, if the patient is performing heel lifts on one leg, you're going to want them to perform the heel lifts on the other leg as well, even if they can perform the dorsiflexions uh, on the other alternative leg. Uh, the reason for that is that the, uh, you know, the interpreting physician is going to make, do a comparison between the right and the left legs. So you want the exercise for the right and the left legs to be the same so that the interpreting physician uh, is making an apples to apples comparison here. So again, we are, the patient is sitting up in their chair, they're resting um, with their legs extended. Uh, you have this, uh, you coach them on how to perform this dorsiflexion. Although of course you don't wanna have the patient perform the dorsiflexion before the test starts. Uh, you're going to place the cuff around the patient's leg. Uh, you want to place the cuff around the thickest, the widest, most muscular part of the patient's leg. I have, I see some technicians that sort of like to put this cuff around the patient's ankle and then going up. That's not going to give you good test results. There's not really enough cross-sectional area, not really enough blood to be able to uh, watch to be able to look, perform the test properly. So again, the thickest or the widest part of the calf. Most of the technicians that I've spoken with have a preference for the venous sense cuff. Uh, the venous sense cuff works great. It's designed, you know, it's really designed for the study and it matches the venous sense cuff port that's on the, the device. Now, that being said, I personally find it challenging in some situations to apply the venous sense cuff to the patient's leg. It's a larger cuff. It's designed to accommodate a larger leg or maybe a patient suffering from swelling. Um, in this situation though, um, you can use the calf and arm cuff from the arterial study. The, the reason to do that would be uh, if you're, you're having a hard time fitting that larger cuff over, you know, getting a good fit on the patient's leg with that larger cuff. It can sometimes be difficult just because it is designed for a larger leg to fit that cuff or get a good tight fit with it if the patient has a slimmer leg like my model did in this picture here. So um, there's not really, they're, they're both equivalent. There's not really a compelling, the only reason that you'd prefer one over the other is just to get a better fit over the patient's leg. Okay, at uh, this time we're actually going to perform the, um, we're going to perform the, uh, actually perform the study using our, our demonstration mode here. Um, give me just a second to log us into the software. Uh, we're gonna click uh, perform new PAD test. Oop, excuse me, not what we're doing today. New venous test. Uh, we've been testing presidents for the last while. I'm going to test, um, let's see, we're, we're going to test Andrew Jackson today. Um, now, typically, when you are performing the venous study, you are going to want to enter all of the patient's information in here. Um, I'm going to get, I'm going to uh, elide a lot of this by uh, saying that this is a screening, which is going to, um, and I'm going to just enter the patient's name and ID number, which is going to let me get past a lot of these required fields. Um, the insurance tab, typically that's also information you need to enter because at the moment, the venous study isn't a reimbursable test. There's not a lot of reason to enter the patient's insurance information. So listing it as a screening prevents you from needing to have to enter that. Uh, if you enter the patient's insurance information here, you're going to need to enter it on this page as well. Um, the history tab is a place to enter the patient's uh, medical history. Uh, again, because this isn't a reimbursable study, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of uh, compelling information. There's not a lot of compelling reason to enter this information. Although at this point, you're probably all familiar with these risk factors since we've gone over them uh, in the, the previous slides. You may, um, just so that you have a, a reason that's recorded in the test, may want to enter the patient's risk factors or um, indications. Uh, for the study, but again, because this is just a screening at this point, that's not necessary.
Um, I do want to highlight on the history tab, you can um, enter the patients if the patient has had any procedures in their vascular history. Maybe they've had a dialysis port, maybe they have a, a shunt, maybe they have a bypass graft, anything along those lines um, that might alter or affect the way the patient's blood flows, particularly in the legs. You're probably going to want to enter. Um, you're probably going to want to enter this here. Uh, in the notes field, um, there are two fields. The bottom one is uh, visible to the patient if they request a copy of the study. For that reason, I recommend putting any sensitive information in the top note field. Uh, the example that I always use, patient is obese, uh, is often true. It's often relevant. Uh, medical information. Um, it's important that the vascular specialist knows this about the patient, but at the same time, it may be a little bit sensitive. So I would, again, recommend putting it in the top field and not in the bottom. Uh, the physical tab, there's not a lot of information that even can be filled out here. Um, the only thing that's clickable, doable, performable, is the SEEP classification, which characterizes the patient's varicose veins. You, may, you know, if you think that this is valuable information, uh, you might want to record it here. Uh, and then finally, the indications tab. Um, a lot of these, again, are going to be familiar with you, uh, familiar for you since we just went over these. Uh, thrombophlebitis, inflammation of the vein, varicose veins, um, venous hypertension, ulcer of the lower extremity, you know, uh, pain in the limb, limb swelling, edema, um, all of those, uh, again, should be very familiar for you. One uh, symptom, one side effect of CVI that I didn't mention, since we are generally speaking focusing on the, the vascular, uh, the, the uh, vascular system in the extremities, uh, that CVI also causes a lot of stress on the patient's heart. Uh, because the, uh, the muscles in the legs aren't helping evacuate blood out uh, the way that they should be, the right side of the heart, which is of course the side of the heart that accepts blood from the rest of, from all over the body um, and reoxygenates and moves it back to the lungs, uh, has to work a lot harder to draw essentially um, that blood from, from the patient's legs. So you'll often find that patients with CVI have an enlarged right side of the heart. Um, and so you may see something like atypical chest pain or painful respiration as well. Uh, I'm going to put us into demo mode, just a moment here, because of course we're not performing an actual study. Ooh. I'm gonna click perform. Uh, it's going to bring us to the patient's right leg. Um, make sure that the cuff is on, on the patient's right calf nice and securely. Make sure that the uh, gray air hose connects the venous sense cuff port to the cuff around the patient's leg, whether that's the venous sense cuff or the calf and arm arterial cuff. Uh, you're going to click start. The system is going to take 15 or 20 seconds or so to uh, establish a baseline for the patient. Uh, we'll talk about what that means exactly here in just a second, but uh, the system is going to pressurize a little bit. You can see that pressure on the top left. It's going to take a moment to calibrate. And then in just a second, it's going to instruct you to have the patient begin the dorsiflexions uh, in yellow. There it is. You'll instruct the patient to begin performing the five to 10 dorsiflexions. You may want to count it out for the patient up, down, up, down, up, down. And then you have the patient stop and rest. You can see those nice big up and down strokes from the dorsiflexions. Um, that's what, uh, and you can see that the blood is sort of evacuating out of the, of the legs. So the top red line, the top bolded red line is the patient's baseline. That's the leg before it starts. And as you perform those dorsiflexions on the left, you can see that trace go down and down and down until the dorsiflexion stops. And then, um, uh, at that point, you can have the you, you have the patient rest and you watch as the leg refills. So you are responsible at this point for calculating the patient's refill time. Uh, the first uh, point that you click on the refill time is the point where you have the patient stop performing the dorsiflexions. So it's going to be the, the lowest point on the trace. It's going to be the point on the trace right after the dorsiflexion stop. Uh, and it is always, again, going to be the lowest or the southernmost point in the trace. So I'm going to select here. And then you need to select a second point. Now, I don't particularly like this demonstration study because it, I, it doesn't actually show um, a typical, a typical uh, 
what typically happens to the uh, what typically happens to the patient. So um, there are two reasons. There are two places to select where the the flow has quote unquote returned, where uh, the the leg has refilled. Now that top red, that top bold red line. Uh, you can see on the left hand side here um, where that 's sort of where the blood the blood started where the leg started before you had the patient begin the dorsiflexions um, what you really want is you want to wait until the uh, trace reaches that top red line at that point the leg has returned to baseline um, and it has the leg has refilled uh, however in some in some cases for some patients and that 's the demo study. Uh, that we're looking at right now, um, the leg doesn't refill all the way to the baseline. It reaches a certain point and then it levels off. Uh, at that, when you see a situation like that, which is what we have here, what you want is where the patient has returned to, uh, where the patient's, patient's trace stops increasing, um, where it, effectively where it levels off or tableaus. At that point, you select the return of flow. At this, I think that it, it um, is no longer refilling about here, which gives us a refill time of 24.1 seconds. Now, it's very easy to determine whether a patient is normal or abnormal. Um, a normal or a healthy refill time is greater than 20 seconds. An abnormal uh, refill time or an indication for CVI is 20 seconds or less. Uh, this patient, despite the fact that they didn't return to baseline, um, has a refill time of a 24.1 seconds, which does indicate a healthy patient. Uh, the test is broadly similar on the left leg. It's identical. Um, and there's not a, I don't, you know, see there's a lot of reason to show you guys that exact same demo study again. So at this point, I'm going to move us all back to the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so this is an, another, another real life study. I just wanted to show you, um, uh, a, a different study, a real life study, so I could show you how that's the similarities between the demo study we just looked at and a, you know, a real life study. So broadly speaking, you'll notice that things are pretty much the same. Um, you still have the, the screen looks the same. A couple of differences that I wanted to highlight. Um, these dorsiflexions look a lot more like actual dorsiflexions than what the demonstration graph shows. The, you, they should have, they should be very strong, very well defined with a, a big peak and a big trough in that, uh, and you should be able to see those, uh, that blood evacuating out of the leg very, very readily just by watching um, the patient perform their dorsiflexions. Uh, just like on the last study, uh, we begin our uh, refill timer calculation by selecting the lowest, the southernmost point on the trace right after the, we, uh, right after the patient has completed their dorsiflexions. Uh, we watch the blood refill and then um, we select the point where it crosses the top red line. That gives us a refill time of about 16 seconds, which does indicate mild to moderate venous insufficiency. Okay, at that point, the test is completed. You perform the right and the left legs. You go back out of the test and you click test sign to add your signature. Um, you go to the home screen and click send slash receive tests. There will be a pop-up. You can click send sign test to send those out or uh, if you're looking for interpreted studies, you go to the exact same place and you click get scored tests and those will download back to the laptop. Uh, because of a series, because of a large number of naturally occurring risk factors, uh, for those of you who are um, going to attend the Wednesday webinar where we talk discuss the arterial study, um, you'll notice. Or for those of you who attended the uh, vascular assessment protocol yesterday, you'll you'll recognize that there's a lot of overlapping risk factors between CVI and PAD. Things like a history of smoking, a history of diabetes, a history of hypertension, uh, etc. Because of that, patients with CVI are a lot more likely to have PAD. Uh, in 2017, and I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, uh, the test 93965, which was previously used for this study, for the venous refill study, has been removed. There's not a replacement code, and we're not anticipating that there's going to be one before 2018, although we are working on having a code uh, inserted uh, for that purpose. Because of that, we're recommending that you perform um, this 
uh, pad net, you, we, excuse me, that you perform the venous study as part of our vascular assessment protocol. You have the patient, you uh, have the patient come in, you uh, perform the venous study. You, you saw me do the whole thing. It took four or five minutes, uh, not very long. And then you lie the patient down on the table and you perform a, um, a, a, a segment of the peripheral test where you just perform waveforms uh, on the patient's ankles. Uh, if either of those results are abnormal, then you're indicated for the, for the full PAD study. Uh, if you bring the doctor back in to discuss the results for the, the vascular assessment protocol, um, then you can, then you are eligible to bill for an office visit like 992, 99213, uh, something along those lines, um, and discuss the results of the vascular assessment, maybe recommendations about smoking cessation, maybe the patients are diabetic and diabetic, they would require or benefit from diabetic shoes or diabetic compression stockings, uh, both of which are uh, the patient should be eligible for after a abnormal PAD, PAD study. Um, other uses for the um, other, there are other ways that you can identify patients for the vascular uh, assessment. One of the tools that we found helpful are the brochures that are handed out with the patent device when you guys purchase it. Uh, they explain the disease, uh, ex explain the test preparation strategies, uh, they explain the test. Now, I think a lot of patients um, have a sort of a fear of testing. Possibly they're uh, imagining something along the lines of a colonoscopy, something invasive, something that's going to affect their, you know, the rest of their day. Whereas this, the, the study that we're performing, it's non-invasive. As long as they're wearing a pair of shorts, you know, they don't even need to, uh, you know, there's, there's, there, there's not going, it's not going to affect the rest of their day uh, in any way. They can go back around their, about their normal activities as soon as the test is completed. Uh, and I think that these brochures are a really good way to sort of um, help the patient both to understand the disease that you're testing them for and to understand uh, that this isn't an invasive test and isn't going to affect the rest of their day, which in my experience makes them more likely to actually come to the test. Uh, giving pa patients questionnaires can help identify you for the uh, for the PAD test. It's no longer really relevant for the CVI test since, again, that's no longer reimbursable. Uh, we found that these questionnaires are best given out when the patient's in the exam room waiting for the doctor. It puts them sort of, it brings them sort of fresh to mind uh, so that when the doctor has a, uh, interviews the patient, asks them some questions, uh, that they have the you know, they have a, a little bit of foundation about what we're talking about and, you know, good things to talk about with the doctor's office. You're also going to want to keep an eye out for the visual cues. I, I have, uh, I try to touch on those when we go over them, but uh, varicose veins, again, they, they link very, very strongly with uh, CVI. Uh, the reddish, brownish, or purplish discoloration of the lower extremities, uh, edema or swelling in the leg, uh, hair loss or uneven, dis uh, uneven distribution of hair. My um, trainer had a favorite saying, which is hair don't grow where blood don't flow. So if you're, you're seeing a patient with a lot of hair loss or unusual distribution of the hair on the legs, it's possible it's because of some vascular, vascular problem and that's, it's something that should be examined. Ex examined, excuse me. Um, and lastly, very, very similar to the, the, Previous bullet point, poor hair and nail growth on the legs and feet is usually an indication of uh, something wrong with the vascular system that should be looked at. Uh, one further option for identifying patients is uh, creating reports in your medical record system. Uh, for most medical records, uh, creating a report for patients on a specific risk factor or a specific uh, uh, disease or ICD-10 code in their history is, is, is trivial for most, for most EMRs. Uh, creating lists of patients who are indicated or due for PAD studies or who should be tested for CVI uh, with things like uh, phlebitis, thrombophlebitis, um, varicose veins with varying complications is relatively trivial. Uh, and it's an excellent way to identify patients who are, who should be te tested both for CAD, excuse me, CVI and PAD.
early detection and intervention leads to better patient outcomes, just like um, all systemic processes in the patient, being able to identify the disease uh, when it's in its relatively early stages, um, you know, significantly reduces the patient's chance of having a leg amputated, just as one relevant example. That's really what we're trying to do here is uh, help keep patients uh, help have patients keep their legs for as long as possible. So finding the disease earlier may be the difference between, you know, talking to the patient um, and recommending, you know, Mr. Smith, I, I know you can see here the vascular the effects on your vascular problems. Um, I would really recommend smoking cessation compared to meeting Mr. Smith five years down the line uh, and discussing amputation options with him. So uh, it allows for much wider range and more cost effective options for treatment that are less disruptive and less invasive. After your venous study is interpreted, you'll either refer the patient out to receive treatment or treat the patient yourselves, depending on your specialty. Uh, this flow chart displays possible courses of action for a varying severity of C CVI. For mild CVI, a venous Doppler can be performed annually and the patient should be educated on their venous health. Um, patients with moderate CVI should have a biannual venous exam, venous education, um, things like compression stockings, shoes, exercise, smoking cessation, things of that nature. Patients with severe, severe CVI should have a venous exam performed every three to six months, uh, and they, should be, uh, they may be indicated for ablation of those veins as well. Uh, at this time, we are nearing the end of the webinar, so anybody who has any questions, I encourage you to uh, raise your hand so I can attend to those. Uh, I did want to take a moment to highlight a couple of special offers that are available through Biomedics right now. Uh, the first one is technologist certification. Most states and most insurance companies have a requirement that technologists performing these exams have a certification through a nationally recognized body. At Biomedics, we administer a program through the American College of Foot and Ankle Orthopedics Medicine, that's ACFOAM, so that you, um, we can help you get certified for the PadMed exam. Uh, in the past, we used to charge for these uh, certifications, but at present, we have a new program so that you can get those technologist certifications at no cost. Um, what you'll need to do is uh, acquire training. Qu training can be purchased if you would like, but more commonly involves the attendance of the webinars, like the one you're viewing today, or by reviewing the recorded webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, after training, you will need to take and pass an online exam that we can provide for you. After you pass the exam, you're, you're considered sort of provisionally certified under the doctor's supervision. During the probationary period, you, uh, the technologist will need to take and pass uh, excuse me, the technologist will need to perform 10 studies on 10 real patients uh, and submit those. We'll once we see the 10 studies, we'll review them and uh, make sure that there's, you know, these are high quality tests we're looking at. This is at its heart a quality, controls, uh, a quality control program. Uh, technicians who perform at least one test a month, um, Oh, I, excuse me, I, I missed a step. After you complete the 10 studies and we review those for quality, we'll issue you the 12 month certification. Um, in 12 months, if you would like to acquire recertification, all you need to do to acquire that free of charge is to have performed at least one study a month in the interim. If you miss a month, maybe you're on vacation, all you need to do to get back in compliance is complete five studies on the following month. Uh, another service I wanted to highlight is a very, very valuable one if you're looking to increase your use to the PadNet device. Um, this is absolutely what I recommend whenever I talk to an office manager, whenever I talk to a doctor, uh, whenever I talk to an, RV, an RVT who says that they want to perform more PadNet studies. The easiest way to identify patients is by looking in your EMR and finding patients who are already indicated um, so that you can simply assign them for the PAD test or uh, patients who have risk factors and so would be a good fit for the vascular assessment protocol. We'll create two lists, one for the indications, one for the risk factors. We'll filter out the patients you've already performed and then we'll provide you those clean lists so you can, uh, with a script, so you can call and schedule those patients for a uh, study. If we find at least 100 patients, and I'll tell you, I perform a lot of these chart reviews, we always find 100 patients. We'll, pro we'll provide a free month of service at the same level you're already operating under. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to highlight um, before the end of the webinar is our new security vault. Um, this is a physical upgrade. This is a, a 
box that's plugged into your device, um, which includes enhanced security, uh, faster, more streamlined testing, a free upgrade to ICD-10 codes. I know a number of locations who are operating under uh, on our last generation software still looking at those ICD-10 codes, which can be a, a bit of a frustration. Upgrading to the security vault uh, takes care of that. Uh, for those uh, doctors who interpret their own studies, you would uh, upgrade to the security vault means you would no longer need to pay for your read license. That's a, you know, a free, a free part of the security vault. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention that didn't, doesn't make it onto this slide is actually that it makes it device agnostic. So um, currently when you're performing the, the PadNet study, you need a PadNet laptop to go with it. Uh, what the security vault does is it eventually is it actually makes the test performable on any object with a wireless connection. So I've, I've used this. I think it's, it's great. Uh, it, I could perform a test. I've performed a test on my phone, just a regular, regular Android, Samsung, same as everybody else uses. Um, and it, you know, makes it a lot easier for, for everyone involved. Uh, at this point, I am going to open it up for questions. I have a question here from Deborah, and Deborah wants to know how our uh, the security f vault um, increases our security. That's a great question, Deborah, and I'd be happy to talk about it because you know one of the reasons for that that we're doing the security vault is really to help keep everybody ahead of the bad guys, so to speak. So um, there there are two things that are happening in security vault that are different than than what's happening on the previous version of the device. One of them is that we're using a different, more advanced security platform. This, the uh, security encryption that was provided uh, with the device, you know, circa 2008 was secure enough at that time, um, but times have changed and what would have been impossible to crack in 2008 now takes, you know, uh, an advanced uh, hacker, you know, a few minutes to, to decrypt. Um, the second thing, that's the second thing that's involved is that it's essentially it essentially creates a little website that you can perform the test on and then it gets uploaded to the the cloud network that way because it's operated that way where everything's handled on our cloud network there isn't any um there isn't any data on those there isn't any data on the on the device that performs the study so i mean we've been in contact with a number of locations where and those laptops have sort of walked away um, that's, which is a major security breach, a major HIPAA security breach that can sometimes cost millions of dollars. Uh, preventing any of that PHI from ever being involved with the, the testing software makes things a lot more secure on that front as well. So as a great question, Deborah, I would encourage you to give us a call uh, after the end so we can get, get you in touch with our uh, security vault specialist um, who would be able to answer th those questions in a little bit more detail. I don't have any other questions at this time, so I'm going to let everyone go. I appreciate you for attending the webinar, and tomorrow we're going to be doing the arterial webinar, which is really um, sort of the heart and soul of the PadNet device. So I look forward to seeing everyone there, particularly those who are, you know, attending the Biomedics Academy this week. I always love seeing uh, repeating faces, repeating names. So um, I appreciate everyone for coming. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and I hope you have a nice day.